Good evening. My name is Thurman Greco, and the name of this program is Let's Live with Thurman Greco. And we are coming to you live from Radio Woodstock. Uh, I, I'm sorry, tell, we've been talking radio this evening. Woodstock Channel 23, uh, Educational Television. And um, we have a very special guest this evening. She's going to go out live tonight, and then we are going to put her on uh, YouTube which comes in on the channel of Let's Live with Thurman Greco. So can you start off by telling me how is the best way to pronounce your name? Yes, um, so my first name is, it's pretty phonetic, but because there's so many letters, it throws people off. So my first name is Sarah Hanna. It kind of sounds like it's Sarah and Hannah, but Sarah Hanna. And then my last name is Shrestha. So Shrestha. Like a hard well, you know, actually, I didn't have any trouble with the Sarah Hannah. I thought that was beautiful <laughs> because you have all of these A's, yes, you know, which it is just really keeps nice. Going. Yeah, which works out. And what? When did you decide to take this job on? Um, I decided after the last legislative session ended. Uh, we went into the last legislative session with a lot of hope because we had a Democratic supermajority. Uh, we had lots of Democrats in the state Senate. We had a lot of Democrats in um, the state assembly. But however, we were not able to pass any of the bills that were on our list as high priorities, and especially climate bills. So New York has not passed a meaningful, substantial climate bill to meet our goals in the last three years. Uh, three years ago, we passed our mandate, which was a big, you know, a big win. But we also need to pass how we're going to meet those mandates, and we have not been able to. So after brainstorming, you know, uh, what we would do going into the next year, which is the year that we are in, we really realized that we need electoral power because we were doing a lot of good organizing on the outside, but there's a big disconnect between what people are concerned about and what people want on the outside and what world people who run the state government are in, in the inside, in Albany. And I kind of experienced that myself um, firsthand because I was, I was trying to get support from representatives on um, some of the bills that I was organizing on. And I, so I met a lot of them. That's how I met my opponent on a Zoom call. Um, and you know, I was, I was a little bit discouraged by the overall um, lack of urgency and the overall lack of ambition and vision considering that there's so many crises that we're dealing with all at once right now. So somebody, somebody suggested we should run organizers um, for office, and now there's several of us uh, running across the state for state assembly. Okay, so you got into this as an organizer. Yes, as, and specifically climate organizer. So your, pr your main priority is climate change. Yes. That's kind of an important thing for the state of New York. Absolutely, yes. Because we still have a beautiful state. Yes. We, we, have, we haven't totally ruined it yet. Yes, but we are quickly running out of time. Um, New York is further behind on our renewable energy than Texas, uh, which is something a lot of people don't know about. I did not know that. Yes, so wind and solar combined in New York is only 4% of the total energy that we produce. A lot of our renewable energy is hydro, which is, which is limited because you can't infinitely scale hydro. It comes with you know, constraints, physical constraints. Um, so we're, where we really need to invest in is large-scale solar and wind. Um, and that's the bill that I've been working on. It's called Build Public Renewables Act. And what it says is we have been farming out all of these private contracts to private developers to do our renewable build-out, and it has not been going well. You know, private companies need to make profits no matter what they do. They are not designed to be able to um, invest in risk-taking projects that are good for people. And in New York, we have the country's largest uh, publicly owned energy provider, which is New York Power Authority. So we really want to uh, reposition this public institution as a leader in building our uh, renewables that is publicly owned, democratically controlled, which means we get to decide who it services. You know, it should service all of our state-owned and state-leased properties, for example, municipal buildings, schools, libraries, public transit. And then we also get to decide um, that it should serve 
affordable energy, you know, not, not something that's going to be higher than what private utilities charge. And we have a state law right now that effectively bans New York Power Authority from making new energy. Uh, this was a bill that was introduced at, at a certain point, and it mainly exists um, to favor private corporations. So we want to get rid of that ban and, and actually do the opposite and really empower our own public institution to be the leader of our renewable energy, which is very relevant right now. I just came here from um, a rally to cancel uh, debt ut utility that people are experiencing with Central Hudson. Uh, Central Hudson relies primarily on fracked gas right now, on fossil fuel, and fossil fuel is something that's going to be increasingly unreliable and unaffordable for people. So we really need to very quickly have a sustainable renewable energy grid, um, and, and that's what I've been organizing for the last couple of years. And you, you say that you were uh, an organizer and you worked in Albany. Not in Albany because we were working on this bill during the pandemic, so it was very much Zoom-based. So I was meeting a lot of representatives on, on Zoom. <laughs> so you, you really have been, in the last few years, out in your district and not focused physically in Albany then? Yes, yeah. And how long have you been um, active as an organizer? So right now, this bill is through this coalition called Public Power New York. Um, I seriously started organizing with that organization last year. It's a coalition of many organizations, actually. Um, and, and they are relatively new. Um, and and the, the bill that I'm talking about is the first one that we have introduced as a coalition. Uh, but I have always done some kind of political activism uh, my whole life. I grew up in Nepal. It was a very, um, I, I grew up in the midst of a lot of political turmoil in Nepal. I think I was around nine or 10 years old uh, when there was a huge, uh, you know, somewhat violent from the state side um, uprising for democracy. Because when I was little, it was, it was monarchy and it was a long, uh, you know, hundreds of years old of, of a monarchy rule. Um, but I vividly remember the day we won uh, the democracy. I went. I remember the parade that went outside our house. And then after that, um, there was lots of disagreements on which direction our democracy should go into. And uh, very quickly, there was a civil war that really picked up um, speed because there was extreme poverty that was neglected. And so a lot of people were recruited into this civil war. And it really changed the country, you know, that, that it, was, it lasted for 10 years. And that was when I was, you know, a teenage um, person in, in where I was growing up. So I've always been tuned into, I've always seen everything politically. And, you know, so my worldview has always been informed by people's rights, especially people's rights to public goods um, and, and to a, you know, a, a dignified quality of life. So, and so when did you come to this country? I came here in 2001 um, as a transfer student to go to college. Um, I did not know anything about New York other than what I had seen in movies. Uh, I did not know, uh, my campus was in Long Island. Uh, I did not know where Long Island was in relation to anything. I was just like, let's go to New York. It was also the first school I applied to. I got a partial scholarship, so I came here and I discovered New York, you know, slowly um, on my own terms over the years. So you've been living in New York uh, since 2001. Yes. So that's, that's over 20 years. Yes, it's basically half my, because I'm 41, so it's half my life um, I've spent in New York. And when you, were, when you hit this country, how did you get involved in American politics? Well, I came to this country in a very politically charged time because it yes. was, yes. It was a few, I actually, I think I, I arrived a few weeks before 9-11, I think. And, you know, I've always been very anti-war, um, very an, um, anti-imperialism. So I got, I got tapped into it right away because, you know, there were a lot of um, chatter on campus, for example, where people were saying very uninformed things about wars, uninformed things about other countries. Um, so, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I found my um, political voice right away because I started writing, you know, for our school newspaper, 
about why wars are not good, especially the, the war on Iraq. Um, and I have always been interested in the progressive um, uh, push for progressive politics in the U.S. Even as an you know even as um, an outsider, I have always observed you know American elections and so on. So um, yeah, I think I, I felt like I fit in right away in terms of the political spectrum. <laughs> I, I want to ask you a question, and I don't want you to take it uh, the wrong way, yeah. but I am very curious to know, you've been here 20 years, politics is in your DNA, you've already uh, made that very clear. At what point did you decide that running for political office in New York State was for you? Yes, I became a citizen in 2019. So I took a long time deciding if I should become an American citizen. Part of it is in Nepal, as a woman, your citizenship has a lot of um, symbolic significance. For example, in Nepal, you cannot transfer your citizenship to your children if you're the mother, you know. So, so we, I had this political relationship with my citizenship and I, and I held on to it um, for a long time. And then here, you know, Bernie Sanders ran in 2016. Um, then, you know, and Trump won. The, the climate crisis was getting increasingly worse. So at a certain point, I felt like, okay, like I just have to accept that I've been here more than half of my life, this is where my future is going to be, this is what my world has been, and I need to start doing work for where I am right now instead of being you know, half in the US and, and half across the world. Um, but the specific moment, and I prefer being behind the scenes. You know, I was a climate organizer working on bills, you know, working on um, legislative debriefings, which is not a very public facing kind of work. And that's actually my comfort zone. So being a public person is very new to me. I have never <laughs> done this before. But the specific moment when I decided this is for me um, is when my fellow organizers suggested that I run and I saw how much hope they had in that idea, how much work they were willing to put into it, um, and how much trust they were putting into me. And when I realized that I, I, if I ran, I would be running as a movement candidate, I would be representing a movement, and I trust myself to uh, stay true to the goals of this movement, then I decided, yes, I can do this. Uh, but, you know, when I decided uh, to do this, my biggest fear was how am I ever going to speak in front of people in public? How am I going to do a debate? But I did a debate last night and, you know, I, just, I guess you just get used to it. <laughs> well, that, that raises another question. Uh, you had to ask yourself, how am I going to get in front of people? How am I going to do a debate? How am I going to do this? Did, were there... And you talk about going to college. Did you take any classes? Do you have a mentor? Did, did, how did this happen? My mentor, so I organized with Mid-Hudson Valley DSA, which is a chapter of Democratic Socialists of America. It's a national um, organization. It's not a party. It's an old organization, but it was revived once Bernie Sanders ran for office and, and lost in 2016. So it became um, an older organization to an organization that was revived by younger people in, you know, basically in and after uh, 2016. And I joined the Mid-Hudson Valley DSA chapter once I became a citizen because I felt like, okay, this is the next step. This is what I truly believe in. And, you know, so I should put my time into serious organizing. Um, and, you know, there are incredible organizers um, in this group. You know, I have learned so much. People are putting serious strategies, serious long-term plans, serious base building, serious um, you know, public out, outreach, um, mobilization, and, and, and very thoughtful ideas in how we're going to win, how we are actually going to build power for what we're going to fight for, uh, what are the strategic steps um, to get there. 
And that's, that has been my, my mentor, like not just one person, but generally this being in this movement, you know, being in this collective action that has been picking up since 2016. I, I've learned many things by just being involved. Are you involved with any other people that are also running for office? Yes. So speaking of mentors, I do want to mention DSA has six elected in the state legislature right now. We have two uh, state senators and four assembly members. And as um, an organizer, you really get to see up close what they're able to do, what kind of problems they run into, or what kind of support they need. So watching them um, work as electeds is also for me a, a form of mentorship because they are very giving with um, what they have learned. Uh, they, are, they try to make the processes that happen in Albany very transparent. For example, um, every time we pass the budget, they do a little um, sort of um, a, a panel on how it works, what happened, what did we win, what did we lose, and why. So that to me has been a direct form of um, education. Oh, that's very important. Yes. And all six of them have endorsed me and are supporting me and have given me a lot of guidance. So that is very valuable because they are also organizers in office and that's what I am trying to be. You know, we have a joint goal. Uh, so to already have six people in, in, in Albany is very helpful. And now I'm running as um, a candidate on two slates. One is a slate called Green New York, which is just DSA candidates. There's a handful of us, um, a few of us are, are running for state senate and the rest of us for state assembly. And I'm also running on the Working Families Party assembly slate, which is called We Can't Wait, and that has nine candidates. So I am not running in vacuum. I am running to really you know, represent the push that has been happening to really put um, our state on the right path, and really not just our state, but I think that New York is in a position to really change um, the course of our politics nationally. I feel like we have the resources and the people um, where I feel like we have a responsibility and duty to create a model government, and that's our ultimate goal, is to really redefine what a government should be, especially at the state level. And we feel very optimistic that if we can prove and make it work in New York, that we can have a rippling effect um, in the country and, and you know, hopefully move away from ne neoliberalism um, altogether. Ev, as you work toward this goal and listening to you, I get the feeling that you are committed for the long haul. This is your career. Yeah, I, I, I am committed for the long haul, whether or not it means being in office. If I lose, this is not a project that I'm dropping. You know, if I lose, I'll probably want to hop on, hop back on an issue-based campaign, like Public Power was the one that I was really, you know, putting a lot of time into. Um, but either way, if I win or lose, I think the things that I'm planning on really uh, putting, you know, give, give new energy to is going to be the same. Um, a, as an elected, I would be able to do a few things that I can't from the outside. Um, I really think this office can be used to give, um, you know, to, to uplift the movements that happen outside, especially for climate, and, and to also unite um, the sort of community organizing that's happening around different issues and give it voice in Albany uh, because it, it, there is a disconnect, you know, um, and especially in this district. I've personally knocked over 1,500 doors. Our team of volunteers ha has knocked over uh, 14,000 doors. And it is so refreshing to talk to people and hear what they say because we all agree on what we think is not working and what we think needs to happen. So to be able to give voice to that as an elected I think would create a lot of space for what we can do in New York. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a transplant. Uh, I moved to New York State in, when, in my 60s. Mm -hmm. My husband and I made the decision that this mm -hmm. is where we wanted to retire. And I think that New York State is such a beautiful place yes. and offers so many opportunities. And I, I don't want to be disappointed. Yeah. You know? And climate is so important. And here we have this beautiful state. Yes. 
that we need to think of all the things that we need to do to make sure that we do not let this state down. Yeah. Yes. We have an obligation to this state. This isn't one of the, uh, you know, this is an important <laughs> state. Yes, and it has an important role to play in global yes. politics. Yes. And so I, I am, when you talked about how you were uh, following in the, with uh, Bernie Sanders, I, th I thought that was really nice. How important is that to your, to your win? Uh, which is? Uh, being um, a democratic... Oh, the Democratic Socialist of America? Yeah. I mean, I would not be able to run for office if it, if, if it was not for the people from those organizations that are putting so much of unpaid labor, labor of you know, love, basically, into this campaign. Um, people are, you know, my team members are putting in um, a whole job worth of time into this in addition to their actual job. You know, this is a passion driven um, project and I just happen to be the face of it but really it, this campaign is a lot of people and I, 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 I would not be able to run without them. It would be impossible. The amount of work that we are putting in right now on a daily basis to get volunteers out, to knock doors, to raise money because we're also not taking corporate money um, and to, to you know speak about our policies, you know to put out our messaging. It's an incredible amount of work. There's no way I would be able to do it alone. So I would say it's a hundred percent. My my victory is hundred uh, percent dependent on you know being able to work with movements. You just said something that was very important, and of course it's true, and it's been true for a while. But a lot of people don't know it. Is you don't take any money from any business. Yeah. So that definitely shifts your fundraising activities. Yes. What are you doing? Everything we can think of that does not involve taking money from corporations. Um, you know, we do. We write lots of emails. We write. A, we spend a lot of time writing emails, reminding people that this race is not about me. It's about what they can win. What's on the line, right? And people have been very giving. We have sold T-shirts. Um, uh, my partner here is wearing one. We sold a lot of T-shirts and, and sweatshirts. Uh, we call everybody we know in our life. Some of our volunteers have called everybody they have ever dated uh, to ask for $20 here and there. So you got to try everything. But the good news is people are so eager for change anywhere. Uh, you know, I think people feel a, a, a united sense of anxiety and, and, you know, frustration that when you ask people for money, they are willing to give. It's not a lot, uh, but, you know, nobody, nobody has yelled at us for asking for money. People feel like it's their privilege to be able to give to this campaign. But we, have, we try everything possible. <laughs> well, um, if someone is new to, to this, based on this program, and this program will go out onto Zoom, so it's going to go out, you know, planetary. Yeah. Uh, how can they send you money? Um, yes, so if you go to our website, which is sarahanaforassembly.com, there's a friendly button there that says donate. You hit, hit the button, and um, it's pretty straightforward. You can pay with your credit card. And are you getting money nationwide? Where is, where is your money coming from? It's mostly coming from the state. I think um, our next filing uh, deadline is the May 27th, I believe. So we've, we've started crunching some numbers. 70% so far is from the state. Um, and the rest is from all over the country. And we have over 250 donations from the district. Um, in the district, sometimes when we knock doors or when we phone bank, give people a call, Sometimes they will donate on the spot or after we've left. Um, so that has been very encouraging because, you know, to give money to a campaign that you've just heard about is, you yeah. know. Is <laughs> that, that's why I'm asking. Yes. I'm, that's, that's a big deal. Yeah. And, and people have been very, very giving. Um, yeah. I think that um, if you can um, make the case that it's not worth taking corporate money, I don't think it's worth taking corporate money. Um, I think our government is, has been rendered very ineffective because of corporate and lobbyist influence. You introduce something and they will have a very strong opposition to kill any bill. Right. You know, 
I just came, the, the rally that I just came from, we were talking about this bill called All Electric Buildings Act. And what it says is for any new construction, building construction starting 2024, we don't, we don't have an infrastructure in those um, buildings for, for gas, for fossil fuel, basically. Oh, that's wonderful. I love the sound of that. Yes, it's a that's very music. popular bill. It's a very okay. popular bill, but there's a lot of opposition in it from within um, the state legislature and also from private energy companies who have, uh, you know, there's the, the, who have basically created an AstroTurf campaign under a very good sounding name to oppose a bill like this, you know. But in New York, a third of our carbon emissions comes from building, cooling, and, and heating. And um, I believe the IPCC report, the latest one, said that building emissions altogether account for more emissions than cars, pla planes, buses, and trains combined. So we're talking about a lot of building emission. And at some point, we have to make a commitment, and then we have to build the renewable energy that we need in order to meet that commitment. So uh, this is important for your election, you know, follow, following through on yes. this. Have you had any... Um, Elders, have you had any people who are in politics that have um, aligned with you, or have you aligned with other people in some way? On this specific bill, mm -hmm. um, Senator Jan Metzger, who is now on the cannabis board, she's no longer um, a senator at the moment, but she has been pushing for this bill. Um, and in the legislature, you know, it was introduced by one of the assembly members who endorsed me, Emily Gallagher, in the assembly, and by a, um, a state senator, Brian Kavanaugh, in the state senate, who's been there for a while. So it's not by any means um, a radical bill. There is a lot of alignment on it, but there is that us business as usual opposition to anything that we try to do. You know, it right. happens at every step. What, what kind of cooperation and support do you get from uh, as being a woman? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't, you mean when I'm canvassing or when I'm organizing? And always, when you decided to run everything, every step of the way, what is it? I don't know specifically as a woman, um, I do know that, you know, I am a trusted organizer in my own um, circle of, you know, colleagues. But I do think that sometimes people think I don't know very technical things because I am a woman. Um, for example, people will think that I have never read a bill that I am talking about, but I always read the bills. In fact, I highlight parts in it that I am interested in. So I, I am... I am a, a, I'm basically a nerd, but I think because I'm a woman, people assume that I am just all talk and that I don't actually know what I'm talking about. So, so there's that. So how do you overcome that? Um, I overcome by sticking to the message, uh, not losing my cool. Um, I love... I love talking to people. I love canvassing. I love it when, as an organizer, I meet somebody who maybe has doubts about me and we have a conversation and I have brought that person to the table, you know, to, to my side. I love that feeling. So when it comes to that, I think I'm pretty patient. I don't like to get hung up on things that are not in my control um, in terms of what people think of me and so on. But I want to make sure that because I have been chosen as a messenger for a lot of these messages that I'm doing a good job of, you know, explaining that to people. Have you been getting any coaching to help you with your presentations in public? Yes, all the time. Yes. Um, I, I was saying previously that I'm not a big public speaker. And, you know, every time I have spoken since then, I have gotten, a, you know, lots of feedback, sometimes uninvited. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but there are a lot of people giving me feedback that has helped me discover my own strength as a speaker. I think I have realized when I'm effective and you know what I, I could work on more. So yeah, in, in terms of feedback, there's, there's lots of feedback and, and help. 
I'm, I'm wondering, um, in terms of giving speeches, who writes your speeches? Um, I do, yes. I am, I am very particular about the way I want to say things, the language I want to use. Um, of course, you know, now that I have become a lot busier um, uh, running this campaign, going to, uh, you know, going door to door, I have help from our comms team um, that are very great at writing these emails that I was talking about, where they raise a ton of money just by writing emails. Um, and they are always available uh, to assist me, and they're also the ones, you know, who give me feedback, who sometimes listen to me and, and tell me what was good in it, what we should reuse. So I have help like that. But when, when it's things that are, you know, that I am saying, it's usually straight from me. But, in, but you know, we do uh, workshop and, and discuss what is effective that I said. That oh, I that's say wonderful. Anything. Yeah. And so when you go into these workshops and things, are you there with other women candidates? Um, not in this particular instance, because this is within my own campaign. Um, but we've also have had um, some group meetings where we generally talk about how to message your campaign. And, and there, yeah, there are women in that, in that situation. I think that's so important because, uh, you know, this is going to sound very sexist, but the men have gotten together for, for generations, <laughs> and now we're starting. And so the, any support that you can get yeah. is very important. So when is your election day? Uh, it's June 28th. Wow. Yes, so not that much time left. Um, it's about five weeks until early voting starts, which is June 18th. There was a lot of um, uncertainty because of the redistricting that's happening this year that had the dates in flux. I think originally we were going to have all of the primaries on June 28th. Um, that includes um, the governor's race, the lieutenant governor, the Congress, the state senate, and the assembly. But I think now the latest is that they've split it into two dates. Um, I think ours is going to be on June 28th and uh, the rest is going to be sometime in August. Ours might be with the governor's race, but it's, it's been changing day to day, so. Oh, that's stressful. Yes. <laughs> that, that's really, that's a toughie. Yeah, it's not helpful because people are already not um, super informed of, about, you know, local races. So it, it definitely does not help. It, it, it's been creating additional confusion, but... Um, it sounds and who like is be, making these decisions? Um, it, so basically what happened is we, you know, we are due for redistricting based on census data every now and then. And th this year was the one we were, you know, these districts were up for redistricting. And, um, you know, the, the state legislature, the state government went through um, the process of coming up with the lines that everybody voted and agreed on. But then after that, there is a period where those can be challenged in court. So that was what was happening, is that it was being challenged in court, and it can go back and forth for a little bit. So then we just wait until that happens. Yeah. And uh, what is your district? So my district is District 103. Uh, that includes Kingston, Woodstock, Saugerties, Olive, New Pulse, Gardner, um, Red Hook, Rhinebeck, Esopus, Rosendale, Marbletown, Hurley, so it's a big, pretty big district. In town of Ulster, it has a total of 14 towns. And you're doing this by yourself? The door knocking and stuff? Yeah. Yes. Well, we have a team of people who go out every day, but yes, it's, it's difficult. But uh, the, the doors do add up. <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. You know, they really do. And, you know, and, this, and, and it's not... Um, the terrain is difficult too, you know, for example, some of the driveways in places like Woodstock, Salvador's Gardner, it's, it's challenging, but when we do show up at the door in places like that, people are usually very glad to see a, a human yes. and have an opportunity to, to talk, yeah. So have you, ma have you made it through half of your district yet? We have made it through the, the first pass, um, we have made it through more than half. Oh wow! Yeah, we have made it through more than half. Um, what we want to, what we, what campaigns typically do, 
if it's a campaign that is very reliant on door knocking, you typically have to make multiple passes to catch people who have not made up their mind or to catch people who are not home. So, you know, we've collected um, all of our supporters. We're finishing a lot of our first passes. And we hope that in the next five weeks, in many places, we can make second passes, third passes. In Woodstock, actually, we've been able to start our second pass. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, I was uh, in the Woodstock Democratic Committee for a while, and I had the downtown district, mm -hmm. and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And then I had out in the Bearsville Flats, and yep. I love going out there yes. because the people are... And, but then there, there are other areas where you drive, and yeah. then you go on the driveway, and then you... So it is, it is a challenge, but it's yeah. extremely important. And we just have a little Honda Fit, and it did break. It did break down once because we were canvassing too much. Uh, in, Ros in Rosendale, we we hit a, a a rough road at one point, and a part fell out of the car. Oh my goodness! <laughs> but but I think we're getting the hang. We're getting better at it. So, but I hope our car will stick it through. <laughs> well, you know the thing that you're doing that I feel, I feel when people when people run for office, you're running for office. But you're making an investment. Yes. You are making an investment. Because truly, whether you win or not, yes. what you do with this campaign is what is important. Yes. And you have already said that even if you don't win, uh, you plan to work on climate change. Yes, so absolutely. That is a huge commitment. Yes. And, you know... But, and I don't feel like I have a choice because, it, you know, a lot of people, increasingly, especially younger people, feel like there's not much point in trying to have a private life when the world is in this chaotic moment that, you know, really we have not experienced of this scale um, as a civilization. So I think more and more people feel, especially younger people, that we don't have a choice. We have to do something about it. And we especially see this in you know, um, kids who are in high school, you know, getting very involved in, in climate work. Um, but yeah, I think that there's, there's no getting out of it. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that is encouraging to you then. As you go around, if, if you meet young people, you meet middle-aged people, you meet older people, and they are supporting you in, in what you're doing. Yeah, actually, you know, um, Older voters, by which I mean older than 70, have been very supportive, which is not what is usually the narrative. The narrative usually is, oh, when a young person runs, they'll get the young voters, but the older people will vote for the, the status quo. That is not the case in my experience in this district. There are lots of people who have been fighting for these things, especially climate, for a long time. And um, a lot of frustration on how slowly things are moving. Well, I, I've been, I have been working for client, uh, climate change since um, 1960, yeah. which is a long time yes. ago. Yeah. And I can remember in 1960, well, I'm going to go to 1974. I'm going to go there. In 1974, I was at a, um, a, there was a group of people, hundreds of people, several hundred people, and the speaker was trying to determine where the priorities were. Mm -hmm. And I said that the priority was the climate, mm -hmm. because if you mess up the planet, there's, that's it, Yeah. no matter what. And, and I, I gave you my book, so you know that I'm interested in hunger. Mm -hmm. And there was a group there, there were several hundred people, and I was the only one in the room that saw climate as being equal to or more important than hunger. And you know, hunger is for the short haul. You know, you, if, you can, if you can organize yourself to distribute food, mm -hmm. hunger is for the short haul. Climate, you know, when it's over, it's over. Yeah. And so um, that, that's been a struggle. Yeah. And, and I think 
Uh, has anybody talked to you about solar? Uh, yes, lots of people. About solar, you mm -hmm. said? Yeah, lots of people have talked to me about solar. What are they saying? Um, well, I think that there is, first of all, there's, you know, you mentioned uh, being involved since the 60s and 74. Since then, because people have known the, the, the information about climate change and where we were heading has been known for a while, even before the 60s, really. But there has been a huge misinformation campaign by energy companies, right, by fossil fuel companies. Um, and it has really made everything unnecessarily um, complicated in terms of how people understand things. So for solar, one thing that has happened is people think that when we talk about solar, we're just talking about putting it on your roof as an individual. Um, but that's not going to be enough if we are talking about truly converting into a renewable energy. We're talking about large scale um, solar. The other thing, you know, is that people assume that just because something is renewable, it's also infinite. Um, that's not the case because solar still requires, uh, you know, um, the, the materials for the equipment are, are still limited. So we, we need not just solar, we also need a sustainable economy to sustain the level of energy that we have. Um, but, but, you know, in, in our work, in the public power work, we are focusing on wind, solar and geothermal. Um, when we say we need to build up renewables, those are the three things that we are talking about. So solar is front and center, and especially for Ulster County, um, its potential is mostly in, in solar uh, compared to wind. Um, so, you know, it, the, it would be very good to have um, uh, built trust between communities and um, our public institutions who will build the renewables so that the communities have a role to play in siting of these projects, can have an input, and then they truly understand what, why does it benefit them? You know, what are they getting out of it? Because the, the power of public projects is the revenues, the profits don't go to shareholders, they can be reinvested in communities. You know, we have places here that need good jobs, green jobs. Private solar companies don't have a great record of creating good jobs. You know, they're usually not union jobs, they don't have uh, benefits, so we need to change the perception of uh, the, the maximum potential of what uh, renewable energy based on solar means to us. And in this district particularly, I think it is very relevant because there's also been a lot of mistrust sowed between people who live here and the overall idea of renewable energy because private developers have come in here and basically done whatever they want um, and, and people feel a little bit suspicious of renewable energy and that's something that we need to change. We need to change the relationship between people who live here and the energy that we need to build. Has, is, is there anybody out there who is talking about this project, this subject? Mm -hmm on a community level. In other words, are there any people, or are there any communities that are saying, we are making our whole community solar? We are, yeah. is anybody doing that? Yeah, they're, they are doing that um, more and more, and they are doing it particularly through what's called CCAs, uh, Community Choice Aggregation, and it's an option that exists at the town or, or city level uh, where they vote to, you know, to, to switch to get their energy from CCAs rather than private uh, utilities. For example, New Pulse um, has it um, and, and there's an increasing awareness coming out of projects like that for having local energy, you know, for having energy that is not coming from some unknown place but is part of our local infrastructure the same way the water system is a part of our local infrastructure you know so yeah there are a lot of and there are also lots of um, um, organizations that are sort of um, energy rights type of organizations who are doing a lot of education around that as well the public power coalition that I talked about we do regular orientations where we invite people to learn about things like this 
And when you have, um, with the Public Power Coalition, when you have your, your meetings and things, do people come? At the orientations, yes, they come. Um, and, and also we try to educate people when there are public hearings. You know, we try to make sure uh, that we show up to those hearings and are talking about the, you know, the alternatives because that has, you know, a built-in audience. And I personally went on um, public hearings that was happening to stop the Dan Scammer fracked gas plant in Newburgh. And what I talked about was Build Public Renewables Act and letting people know the option we have because if we can get on our renewable build out, we need we can get off of fossil fuel. You know, it's it's a uh, it's not one or the other. We need both to happen at the same time. So I, you know, we also use the public hearings as a source of uh, educating people. Do you think they work? Yes, absolutely. When we were organizing on this bill last year, um, everybody, lots of people were telling us this bill does not have momentum. This bill is too complicated. It's too wonky. Um, it's a pipe dream. And just a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was even last week, we have done so much organizing and education on this bill, um, you know, persistent outreach with um, groups as well as um, communities and with legislators. We just passed it in the Corporations Committee in the State Assembly where all of the Democrats voted for it except for one. And that is a huge, huge achievement because other bills that have existed even before this bill, you know, are, are still stuck. So there is some success. Yeah. When you imagine yourself, when, I'm not going to say imagine, but when you focus yourself inward mm -hmm. and you see yourself uh, in the ascendant, yeah. what do you see yourself doing? You know, the, the thing that really excites me, other than being able to fight for things in the legislature, is to be able to do things as an elected with the people who are in the district. There's so many things that you can do, show up for, uh, you know, am help amplify. This is a position that can really be used to take strong positions on things that your communities are fighting for and give it the platform that it deserves. That's the thing that really excites me. Like I said, I just came out, came from a rally in Kingston and as an elected, I would have so much fun participating in those kind of efforts and, you know, and, and really bringing it to my colleagues in Albany and, and representing that voice. That is what really excites me. But of course, the thing that you really have to do is, you know, uh, lots of persistent um, uh, outreach with your colleagues to get support on bills and lots of speaking up and meetings and so on. <laughs> but I think the elected can is in a position to really, really, um, you know, to give platform to work that is being in the district by people who are not elected. What do you think, as an assembly member, mm -hmm. what do you think that you bring that nobody else does? Well, I'm not going to say nobody else because I actually think there are so many people who would make great electeds if we had a very democratic system where it's easy to run for office, where there's easy public financing. We have public financing starting in 2024, but we have not had it, um, you know, ever. And um, as somebody who's running for office uh, in a grassroots campaign against the establishment, I can tell you it's not for everybody. It's, it is extremely stressful and difficult and it takes a village to, to run this campaign. But what I am bringing that is different from the incumbent, the opponent that I'm running against, really I think is that I am running not because I want a career in politics, I am running because there's a whole list of things that needs to get done. Um, so we need leadership, you know, we need somebody who's going to say, I'm going to fight for this thing. I'm not saying I'm going to support it, I'm saying I'm going to fight for it. Which is a different thing totally. Yes, it's a different thing totally. Um, and I, I think people see that. I think people, people see the difference between um, lukewarm, going with the flow kind of a Democrat uh, versus somebody who's going to be the ingredient 
that changes the legislature by organizing their colleagues, by organizing their uh, constituents, you know. So I would say the energy and the leadership and, and really the vision. You need to have a vision to guide you as well. Um, a lot of the times people will say, you know, people who are um, entrenched and, and more satisfied with the status quo will say that a lot of these things are impossible, they're too naive. But I think what's more naive is thinking that the situation can go on forever and nothing will happen. You know, that's right. not possible. That's not, that's, yeah. Yes, that, that's something... That, for me, that's the 500-pound parrot in the room because people keep thinking, well, you know, we haven't done this, we haven't done this, so we'll just have to keep on with the regular. Mm -hmm. The regular is going to fall apart. Yes. I, pretty quick. It's not, the regular is not realistic. It does not have infinite... And, and then when the regular falls apart, it's, it's like our international politics where we have this... Uh, gentleman from another country who is bombing another country yeah. and and it's not even our country but it it's creating all these problems that we did not ask for so when something totally caves um, that's what's going to happen then we're going to be stuck yeah so you need to have the planning and the foresight and you need to start you know be stomping around so that's the, to me that's the important thing and there is a difference for me between a person building a political career and a person working to accomplish a goal exactly yeah. that is a completely different thing yes and and i see um elected officials all the time who are politicians yes and that's not what you come across as no no, I think that, yeah, not interested in that. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's there. I mean, it's, yeah. it, and this is how we did it in the old way. You know, in the old way, that's what we did. You grew yeah. up and uh, somebody said, you know, get a, get a degree in law or get a degree in political thought or, you mm -hmm. know, do that and then go into politics or you get a degree in law and then... You didn't like being a lawyer, so you decide to go into politics. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see a political office as being primarily political if you don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that sentiment is, is you know, we, we definitely have a shift in direction in New York. Um, like I said, we have six electeds from DSA. We have um, other pro progressive allies from outside of DSA. And I think they have been pretty successful at changing the conversation of what a government is supposed to do and change the expectation. You know, the, the state government has really been um, getting away with, with not doing much because it's not under a lot of scrutiny compared to the federal government, for example. You know, a lot of people don't know what their state assembly does, that it even exists. You know, when we knock doors, we have run into people who have no idea what the, that what the state assembly is. So, so it gets away with uh, doing very little, even though the state is really the level you can have the most impact on people's lives. You know, you don't have the the whole messy process that we have um, in Congress. We have a specific state that has its that has its place in in a you know in the political spectrum. In New York, we're in a pretty good spot because we're a blue state, so we should be using that power to be able to do everything that we can. And I think there are more and more people running for office that are setting that expectation. And we should absolutely change the narrative to not being good enough, but knowing what we can do better. Because everybody intuitively knows that we can do better. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you can do better. <clears throat> that's, that's an interesting phrase because there's so much that you have to overcome to go beyond the status quo, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, right now, everybody's, I, I, it's just very, very difficult now for, for many people to function at yeah. all. I, I, don't, I don't know how some of them do function. Yeah, a lot, we, have, we have come across a lot of people who have expressed just an overall overwhelming sense of anxiety. You know, mm -hmm. people who have said, I don't read the news anymore, right. you know, and, and that really paralyzes people we want to we want to activate those people and and show them the options we do have because in in new york we're very close to being um having a 
big shift in, in the way we do politics. And that's why we're running these slates of candidates. You know, we can do this in the next five years if we run very strong campaigns and if we keep fielding people who can run for office. That's the other thing is that our democracy is so stagnant um, and so um, built on the idea that you have to be in, in a queue for people to appoint you, um, give you permission to run. I, I reject that <laughs> premise. A, a democracy means really everybody has the right to, to run and then the voters have the right to decide. You know, So I, I very much believe in voters having a choice on the ballot in a democratic primary because like I said, this is a blue state so the choice is really not between the Republican or the conservative and the Democrat. The choice is, you know, who, who's going to be the better Democrat that you want to elect? Well, and of course, the other, the other thing that is there, oh my dear, we're only down to four, to four <laughs> minutes. I wanted to, I wanted to comment on the fact that there's so much happening in, up in Albany and nobody knows any yeah. of it. Yes. I, it's, you know, it's a great big secret, but yeah. we've got to stop. We, you're going to have to come back. <laughs> uh, we, uh, listen, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, we got four minutes. Tell them how to reach you. Yes. So go to sarahanaforassembly.com. That's S-A-R-A-H-A-N-A-F-O-R assembly.com. Our email is there. There's a whole list of pages, uh, pages worth of uh, things that you can volunteer for. Our phone number is there. Our social media is all there. We do a ton of updates on our social media. So, you know, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, sign up for our email list. We send very funny emails. We have been told that our emails are one of the best. So those are all of the things that you can do to follow the campaign. That's great. And do you need any more volunteers? We always need more volunteers. We have five weeks. That's it. So we are, every day we are looking for more volunteers. Okay, so, if you so want this is the big push then. Yes. So you always, more, more, more. Yes, this is the last home stretch. Tuesdays, uh, if you want a phone bank, 7 p.m., we're phone banking. Um, and every day we're, we're canvassing, knocking doors. So there's a ton of options for what you can do. And we have, we're also going to do a campaign update call where people can just come to a Zoom call and learn more about the campaign. So if you follow our social media, if you sign up to our email list, you will know when that's happening. Okay. So... Uh, what about fundraisers? Are there any fundraisers happening? The, every day is a fundraiser. <laughs> we are about to go into printing yard signs, and yard signs are not cheap. Um, so, you know, if you, if you want to volunteer and give a small dollar donation, or if you cannot volunteer but would like to give small dollar donation, that's on our website too. Every dollar goes to a good use. Um, like I said, there's no corporate money that is in our uh, campaign. Everything is going towards the bare essentials that we need, like even printing these flyers, printing yard signs, things like that. I know we're really running out of time, but do you know how much cost it costs to, to get a yard sign? Yes, we just got a quote today. It costs, if you want a screen print, it costs around $6 per yard sign. So if people want a yard sign and they want to generously give $6 for it instead yes. of just picking up a free one, that yes. would be greatly appreciated. Sarah Hanna, it's been wonderful to have thank you. you. Thank you so much. And we've run over time. And thank you so much, Miss Ellen. Thank you, David. Thank you. We love you. <laughs>